Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Pucciolato here in my home studio with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our audio podcast and spread the word on social media. It really helps. We have an exciting episode tonight, and uh, we're going to have another Life and Crimes of episode where we like to look at a legendary underworld figure that uh, someone you've probably heard of, but maybe, um, you know, they don't get quite the due that they deserve in terms of of infamy. (laughs) So in this case, we're going to talk about Mickey Cohen, who was an infamous and notorious Los Angeles-based mobster. And he was connected to Bugsy Siegel, among other people. So uh, this is going to be a, a fun episode. Um, let's uh, let's get into it. Um, can I? Can I yeah, just? Go ahead. I, I want to just give one little editorialize for just one. Of second. course, yeah, jump in. Um, for for people that don't really know who Mickey Cohen is, or only have smaller, lesser known points of references. Uh, I think to put it in modern modern day terminology, I was thinking about this before the show. Um, I think you can draw a real through line in terms of what I would uh, categorize as media friend media frenzy mobsters. Oh, good or media frenzy and media friendly mobsters, uh, and and mobsters that understood that they were a brand in addition to being. They were a commodity outside of being a gangster. I think you can draw a through line from Capone, who was really the the first. And I think Mickey Cohen really bridged a gap between Capone in the 100 years ago and now with Joey Merlino. Uh, and I'll and I'll just tease it and then we'll jump in and go back to go forward. So what? After Mickey Cohen was through his gangster heyday, he was retired for a good chunk of time, not in the rackets, and he was on the on the the nightly talk show circuit, yeah, where he was essentially brand building for himself, telling war stories, being like a. You know, like almost like an artifact of an older time period, but but still being kind of hip and cool because uh, you represented, you know, a, 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 a certain ethos or or swagger or, you know, gangster embodiment. So he, he never, you know, there was no social media with Mickey Cohen, but I could sense if there was a social media, Mickey Cohen might have been there. And I also sense that if Capone would have lived longer and had not lost his mind and had lived into the television era, I could see Capone maybe having done the same thing as these kind of precursor to what Merlino's doing right now. So that's just we'll talk yeah, that, about how Mickey. That's good context. I should have um, mentioned that. Yeah, he was someone who was very comfortable in the public. Spotlight, but also uh, to you, as you're pointing out, he courted media attention. I mean, he would he would invite the media to his mansion to take pictures of his extravagance. Like he was really like, look at all my suits, look his at all dogs, my shoes. his girlfriends, <laughs> right, right, his swimming pool. Like he was very extravagant and showy about it. And um, did he was not going mind. on like Dick Cavett and Mike Douglas and Johnny Carson. I mean, this was in the late. But when uh, he died in the in the seventies or um, seventy six in the seventy six, I mean, but through the late sixties and early seventies, he he you could turn on the television on prime time and see him sitting at a couch talking to Johnny Carson. Yeah, and he said he said because he you know he knew Bugsy Siegel. He said he knew Capone, which I I don't know if that's true, but he but you're right. People got a kick out of this like guy that was he was around those types of dudes. He definitely knew Bugsy Siegel, which we're going to yeah. get into. That's what start. <laughs> Whether or not he knew Capone, but um, so <clears throat> definitely high, high profile guy. He's actually born in New York, 
and uh uh you know depression era new york from a, a low income uh work you know it's like working class jewish family he dies when he was two years old so um you know absentee father so tough his dad economic died, situation right? yeah his, his dad died when he was young so he has you know there's no father um raised by a single mom um, so as you can imagine, in a lot of these cases, not a lot of resources, not a lot of opportunities. He's basically a troublemaker from the, from the moment he's like six, seven years old, becomes um, a juvenile delinquent, gets in trouble in school. Um, the mom decides to move to Los Angeles for health reasons. So he's a you know, he's a pretty young pretty young kid when they do this. But even in California, it's the same thing. He struggles in school. He, it seems like he's more comfortable hanging out at the pool halls and shooting dice <laughs> with, with, you know, these like hard scrabble guys, as opposed to uh, being some kind of upstanding uh, a citizen. His older brother, Harry, is a is a big influence on him. Uh, Harry was a bootlegger and another guy who was involved in <clears throat> gambling and, and things like that. So he was kind of a tough guy himself. He was a big influence on on Mickey. They were involved in petty theft. And so Harry's a big influence on him. Harry moves to Cleveland. And uh, Mickey follows him eventually. And it's there that Mickey becomes uh, this like pugilist, right? He, he, he develops a reputation as a tough guy who can, who can handle himself, who's good with his fist. And um, he actually, you know, has this moment where he, he's getting involved in, in, um, I don't know if it was amateur boxing or professional boxing, but he caught the attention of some national, you know, boxing promoters. And, and a lot of these guys were mobbed up, right? I mean, that's something else, you know, with, with boxing, a including uh, he has some interaction with Frankie Carbo, who was a Lucchese member and a, a major boxing promoter. Also, um, I think Carbo was with Murder, Inc., too. Yeah. Frankie Gray, the man in gray. Yeah. Um, so, which, by the way, I want to get to him at some point too. At at some point, we we want to do a Gangsters of Alcatraz episode where we're going to talk about. We'll mention Mickey Cohen again, Frankie Carbo, Capone, Machine Gun Kelly, different Bumpy Johnson. Frankie Carbo and Frankie Blinky Palermo basically controlled professional boxing for a good couple decades. Yeah. So, so in this case, he actually Cohen. It's not just these like knock around street guys. He's starting to interact with some, you know, some some guys who are who are heavyweights, and um, you know, times are tough still, and he's just not making enough money um, boxing. He was a he was a little dude, even though he was tough. He was a small small guy, and he becomes a um, an enforcer for um, for hire in in Cleveland. You know, as a debt collector things like that. Um, by the time he's in his mid twenties, he moves back to Los Angeles. And this is what I want to ask you about what you think based on your, um, you know, understanding of the history here. He always claimed that he moved back to Los Angeles. He was in his mid twenties at that point that he had met mobsters in Chicago and on the East coast. And they sent him west to him. keep an eye on Bugsy Siegel. And now I know some other people think that that was just Mickey again. Like Mickey would have, you know, kind of mixed tall tales in with with things that were actually happening. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think that's what happened? Or is it just a coincidence that Bugsy was out there? I would guess that there's probably some elements of truth, but I don't know if the entire narrative is accurate uh i think that they were two guys that i guess if you looked at it you know if you were if you were looking at it from a, a, a macro perspective maybe shouldn't have got along and at first I, I know that they they didn't but eventually they were able to kind of see eye to eye and and understand that they were uh, better as a team than as, 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 as separate entities. I don't know how much oversight the, the Midwest guys would have 
to yeah. say to Meyer Lansky and those guys, we don't trust your guy. We want to have a guy out there on our own looking after your guy. Yeah. And th- let's talk about this also for a moment with Bugsy Siegel, because he his you can't talk about Mickey Cohen without talking about Bugsy Siegel, whether or not he was sent out there to keep an eye on Bugsy or yeah. not. They definitely work together um, in terms of gambling, other types of rackets out there. Um, so the the traditional narrative is that the commission sent Bugsy Siegel out to Los Angeles, but there are there's some evidence to the contrary. So, for example, Joe Bonanno in his autobiography said that the the commission wouldn't have the authorization to do that. That Bugsy Siegel was really like an independent contractor, and maybe he had ties to Luciano, but that his decision to go out to Los Angeles was was his own. What do you think? What do you make of that? Um, just trying to so we can understand what like what's going on in Los Angeles. That we have the players Cohen, Bugsy Siegel. But what's the political landscape there? Well, I will say that again. I think there's like um, there there are there are like needles to be thread in some of in some of that narrative where there are I'm sure elements of truth, but I also think the overall narrative is probably accurate because and, and I say this because Bugsy wasn't doing anything that wasn't co-signed by Meyer Lansky. Um at least at that at that point. Mm-hmm. And um now if Meyer was checking everything or okaying everything through Luciano and and the rest of what would become the Genovese. uh, I, I, I don't know, but I can tell you Bugsy would not have headed West without the full sign off uh, backing complicity of Meyer Lansky and Lansky was arguably, you know, he was, top even though he wasn't italian i mean at his peak of power he was probably top five uh on on this continent so so if lance gets co-signing it that that's a de facto way of saying that right so i think at least the uh, west side was signing off on it right i think so it becomes it kind of becomes semantical then yeah it's like well was he sent by the mafia was he sent by lansky was lansky representing the mafia Right. Lansky wasn't in the mafia. He was Jewish. So it it's just there are like, you know, layers to that analysis. And by the way, I think I misspoke at the beginning. I said he was born uh during the Depression era. He he was born in nineteen thirteen. I'm sorry. He was he was a young okay. man during the during the Great Depression. But anyhow, um, so Cohen ends up back in Los Angeles. He's in his mid twenties, he's working with Bugsy Siegel. Already he's developing this uh, notoriety and infamy as a public figure, even though he's a, he's a well-known gangster already. He is known for wearing these zoot suits, uh, you know, the brim hat dressed to the nines, the man about town uh, always has, you know, pretty ladies with him. Um, and he strippers, uh, <laughs> he, he candy, candy bar. Yeah, he was like a was, famous stripper. That was like yeah, his was, longtime paramour. Yeah. 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 Because I don't, yeah. Because, um, and she was quite a bit younger than him too. Yeah. Um, so he is. Um, he actually has a reputation locally. The the news media referred to him as the dapper little hoodlum. So like way before decades before John Gotti has that. Uh, you know that that moniker. Uh, we mentioned he invites the media into his into his home to take pictures. Um, but the LAP, LAPD is out for him, and this is interesting because we know there was a lot of corruption in the LAPD. But there were elements within the LAPD that had a hard on for him that that went after him. And um, he was arrested for a variety of offenses, assault, robbery, uh, bookmaking. Um, Eventually, he's arrested for murder. This was uh, 1945, the murder of a bookmaker, Maxie Sherman, who I think um, if someone can, can fact check us, you know, people who are more familiar with Cohen's biography. I think he was a guy Cohen was shaking down and they, and they had some kind of uh, disagreement and um, either way, Cohen shoots him. Sherman ends up dead, but Cohen claims self-defense and he gets, he gets away with it. Um, I mean, it was so. pretty, 
it was pretty bloody in the late 40s, early 50s in L.A. I know there have been movies and TV shows and books written about uh, that era. James Elroy has kind of <laughs> made his entire. Uh, oh, yeah, for sure. You know, a big, huge part of his literary persona is is chronicling that era. L.A. Confidential. Great movie. Check it out. You youngsters that might not uh, know about it. But um, is there a Cohen character in that? I don't remember. Yeah, Bugs? very, I think very. Bu- there's a Cohen character, but he like barely has a speaking role. He's only in it like for one or two scenes. And is that supposed to be set after Siegel's murder? I can't remember. I haven't yeah. seen that film in a long time. Okay. It kind of starts okay. with the two Tonys murder. Okay. Uh, yeah. Broncano and Rombino, the, um, the the Kansas City guys that were out in L.A. Okay. Um, and. I mean, the, it was the why I mean, it was a full on mob war going on uh, in at that time period that would be akin to anything that was going on in Chicago in the prohibition, anything you saw in, you know, New York with the bananos or the, uh, or the Profaci Columbos. Um, it, it was, it was open warfare and bodies were dropping on a pretty regular basis. I think between like 47 and 52, 53. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, a lot of that was documented too. You can find those images. They're pretty yeah. gruesome. Um, so in 1946, Mickey Cohen is, is implicated in another murder of a bookmaker, Paul Gibbons. <clears throat> and once again, um, you know, there's this, this notion that he's shaking these guys down and if they don't cooperate, you know, he'll, he'll kill them. But he, he ultimately wasn't convicted of this. But to get to your point of when things really start to get violent, I think is post assassination of Bugsy Siegel. So Bugsy Siegel is con- is killed in forty seven. Um, I think June twentieth, nineteen forty seven. In Beverly Hills. In Beverly Hills. And I've I've been to the mansion. I've posted pictures of it on Instagram on our IG account for Gangster Podcast. You can look it up. I mean, it's just um, I don't know if you've ever been there, Scott. It's just in a residential neighborhood. You can just I mean, look it up and you can walk you know, park in front of it, but it's pretty cool because it literally looks just like it did <laughs> when back then. Like it's an old, wasn't school. it Virginia Hills? Yeah. Didn't Bugsy, he brought right. that for Virginia. Hill? Yeah. Yeah. So it was her, it was technically her, her home. So Bugsy Siegel, there was rumors happening. by the way, that Frankie Carbo was the shooter. I don't yes. know if that was true, but there have been rumors that he was the actual trigger man. Yeah. I know. I, I I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, I'm trying to think it was Mickey Cohen himself who said that. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I can't, right. I can't, I can't remember. Someone can fact check us on that. But I, I think it might have been Cohen who was telling people that. Um, I may be mistaken. So let's talk about the Bugsy murder for a little bit, just because, again, it's, it's impossible to talk about Cohen without, without at least spending a little time on Bugsy. Um, we still don't know 100% who killed Bugsy Siegel. Um, but I think that there's a pretty good argument to be made that members of the East Coast Mafia had invested in the casinos or Casino Flamingo in Las Vegas and that there was skimming going on either by Virginia Hill or Virginia and Bugsy or Bugsy knew about it and didn't do anything to stop it. They found and, offshore bank accounts. Right. And that... um in fact, Bugsy was probably warned leading up leading up to this that he better get his affairs in order or else he knows how things work. And um, whether it was hubris or he was madly in love or he I'm not sure, but he, he didn't seem to take it seriously enough. And then we know that he was sitting in the, the mansion there in Beverly Hills reading the newspaper. And someone took him out with a, um, you know, a rifle from from outside. Which is kind of interesting. It reminds you a little bit of the Nicolo Rizzuto um, murder in Montreal, which you know you've been talking about that a lot lately with your reporting. And it's just kind of interesting because that's not very common in this world. When we talk about underworld, like those are the only two examples I can think of where a, a really significant mobster is just chilling in his house, and someone with a you know sniper rifle takes him out. So they shot him in. They shot Bugsy in the eye. Yeah, yeah, you can see the images on Google. And uh, the the Mo Green murder in The Godfather was allegedly inspired by that. Um, yes. Yeah. 
So who do you, what do you so where, where do you stand on who like who killed Bugsy and and why? I mean, I think it's again. I think we know most of the story. We might not know all of the particulars, but I think we know ninety five percent of it. It clearly came from his own people. Um, if only just judging by the fact what happened in the literal minutes after he was dead at the casino, like within an, you know, within an hour of him being killed, you had representatives from the, from the New York and Chicago mafia walking into the casino and telling everyone, stop what you're doing. We are now in control. Uh, there was like an announcement made over the public address system and, and they went into the count room and, um, literally took control of the casino within minutes, uh, within an hour. So I think uh, there's no way that that wasn't, you know, there wasn't some coordination there that they knew that that they how they could get all their ducks in the order so quickly. Yeah. Obviously, the the casino was the golden goose. Yeah, um, it's almost like they were just waiting for someone from LA to confirm that it was. Yeah. It was done. <laughs> it was taken care of. And uh, it, wa- it was a situation that, as we know, hindsight being 2020, sometimes an investment, whether or not you're stealing from that investment or not, sometimes uh, you need a little bit of runway. And it wasn't helping his cause in addition to being you know, caught putting your hand in the cookie jar and selling a lot of pieces of the business that you didn't have to sell that weren't left to sell. Uh, it didn't look like the vision that him and, and Meyer were selling right off the bat didn't look good. It, it didn't, it took a year or two to get into get, uh, hit the, you know, they didn't, they did not hit the ground running. It took them a year or two to get the, um, the 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 whole thing stood up. The grand opening we, was a disaster. right. It was a real disaster, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, he had a bunch of celebrities, and it, it stormed, and um, it it was uh, it wasn't canceled. I think in the movie they showed that it was like canceled in the middle of it, but that was that part wasn't true. I don't think, but uh, it was a yeah, it was a it was a inauspicious be- uh, debut. Yeah, and, uh, let's talk about so, let's talk yeah. about the movie for for a moment, like um, because there is uh, Mickey Cohen is a prominent character in that film, Bugsy. Um, Harvey what was that film? Ninety one. When did that film come? Ninety one. Yeah, spring of ninety one. And Mickey Cohen is played by Harvey Keitel. I think an outstanding performance. I love mm-hmm. Harvey Keitel's performance as, as Mickey Cohen in that film. Um, Scott and I know that there are some historical discrepancies with that film, so I'm I'm not suggesting. People watch it as as like a documentary, but I do think it's an outstanding film. I think it's a underappreciated film. Well, I want to say underappreciated because the critics loved it in real time. When I say underappreciated, I mean today, 2024. It doesn't seem to get the same kind of love and 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 respect that other classic gangster films do. But um, it, it's a great visual depiction of this whole world, Los Angeles, mid to late 40s. Bugsy Siegel, Mickey Cohen, Virginia Hill, who was Bugsy Siegel's uh, paramour. So um, what do you think about Mickey Cohen and, I, and Harvey Keitel's performance? In- well, I love the I mean, Bugsy to me is clearly to me, and it should be in the top 10 uh, if, you're, if you're breaking down great American gangster movies uh, oh, of the last 50 years. Um, I, I found it interesting. I, I think I said to Jimmy before we, we uh, jumped on air. It's interesting how a movie can get critically praised and win all a bunch of awards and get all these nominations. And then 20, 30 years later, nobody really remembers it. And then there are other movies. And I think of Casino, Heat, Scarface that are all time classics that when they first came out, really weren't embraced by the public or the critics. Yeah. The critics uh, hated so, Scarface, especially. <laughs> so, uh, I just think for whatever reason, Bugsy's gotten lost when people talk about great, you know, great filmmaking in terms of telling true crime gangster stories. I also think I said this to Benny. um, You don't really think of Warren Beatty 
even though he did play uh, Clyde from Bonnie and Clyde, you, you don't really think of him as a classic tough guy gangster actor. He's more of a, you know, a playboy um, ladies man. A, I'm a lover, not a fighter type. So maybe that gives a stigma to the movie or whatever. But he that. And I think he's a great actor. I've seen him in a lot of sure. things that I love him in that he does. He's not playing a tough guy, in, but he 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 kills it. He he literally and figuratively he 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 hits it out of the ballpark. Just a great performance by him. Great performance by Harvey Keitel playing Mickey Cohen. Great performance by Ben uh, Kingsley playing uh, Meyer Lansky. Virginia Hill. Uh, that was a career maker for for Annette Benning. I mean, yeah. I don't know if she's. That, that that was that I know she'd existed before, but that took her to a whole other level. And then the, those two married, I think. And then they got something. married. Um, <laughs> yeah. Elliot Gould is a is a cameo there as Harry Greenberg. Harry Greenberg. Yeah. Who that's um, another dude that Frankie Carbo, I think, killed in real life. I think it was Frankie Carbo that killed. And uh, just uh, that's funny, but also poignant and. Uh, some scenes in it that are just some classic scenes, great, di- great dialogue, great action, great violence. I mean, not great violence. You know what I mean? No, I know. In yeah. Terms no, of the- <laughs> depicting uh, violence. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It's uh, I, I highly um, recommend that film. Um, f- and uh, also, by the way, uh, Bonnie and Clyde, I also think is a great film that, that yeah, in my I opinion, one of the, the best pre Godfather uh, gangster films gene hackman's in that flick gene yeah. wilder's in that movie and um who plays um bonnie um faye dunaway yeah and she's like super hot she's hot in that she's hot in that movie with her with her tommy gun and the mini skirt <laughs> it's really for the, for that era and they kind of tell you in that movie that clyde was gay or, or at least Don't asexual. They, yeah, right, there's, yeah. Right. He's she. She wants to jump his bones all the right. time, and he's always like kind of. Right. It's 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 clear that he's in love with her, but it but it seems like an asexual. Not you're right. Right. There, As opposed to Bugsy, where the relationship between oh, Virginia hypersexual. Hill yeah. and and Ben Siegel in the movie is depicted. I the the, the dynamic is great. Just how visceral their combativeness was. And how they were either literally fighting or fucking. Yeah. Yeah. And there's um, a great scene where he he beats someone up. I don't remember who it is. I think it's Jack Dragon in the scene Dragnet. where he really yeah. didn't do that, but in right. the movie he does. And he comes he comes right. to the dinner table and he starts eating. And it's like he's great like scene. literally like an animal, the way he's eating his food, and she cooked him a meal, and she's like getting turned on by the way. A that he had beat this guy up and then was devouring the meal and they like start having sex on the uh it was just I thought it was a great a great scene. Yeah, I said if if earlier if you've if you've ever been in a codependent relationship with <laughs> someone, you can you can trauma bond in that film with <laughs> the dynamic between Bugsy and Virginia Hill. Um but speaking of Jack Dragna, let's so so Bugsy Siegel's killed in 47, regardless of, of who did it and why. And Mickey Cohen you know, when he was asked about it, he said, you know, I, I Bugsy was my guy and I and I liked him. But, you know, this is <laughs> making going again, being sort of sensationalistic and off the cuff, making these these, you know, notorious comments. He said, but it was pretty good for business for me because I basically stepped inherited everything and took over right and took over his operations. The problem with that was Jack Dragna was the Los Angeles mafia don who we haven't properly introduced yet, but you mentioned him. He, there's a character in the film Bugsy. So there was a Cosa Nostra family in Los Angeles. And at the time, J- uh, Jack Dragna was the boss. And he was a, a, a real Sicilian mafioso from Corleone. And he had ties to the East Coast, five families. So that is something in, in the film Bugsy that historically I don't think is is true dragna is viewed as sort of a chump that that's basically slapped around literally and figuratively by bugsy siegel and mickey cohen i don't think that that's true jack dragna Dra- jack dragna excuse me was a serious mafioso a serious mafia don and um with bugsy siegel out of the way 
the Italians view it as this is our Los Angeles is our territory. It was different with Bugsy because yeah, if he represented the, <laughs> the guys back east. <laughs> right. They didn't look at Mickey in the same way. Right. Right. It was one thing with Bugsy Siegel, who had Lansky's backing, which then you can presume means the uh, the uh, Luciano Costello family. It wasn't the Genovese uh, family quite yet. Um, so the Italians and Mickey Cohen battle it out, as Scott mentioned just a few minutes ago. So it's 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 pretty bloody. And by 48, Siegel's gone in 47. By 48, the Italians are taking out some of Cohen's top guys. Top guys really yeah. outlandish, public, and, you know, um, brazen. England style. Right. Not luring Chicago a guy 1929 to a, Tommy yeah. Gunn hits. Right, not like luring a guy out to a warehouse somewhere and you never see them again. I mean, like in public cowboy, cowboy style nightclubs and you know on the street, leaving bodies on the street. Yeah. Uh, one of the more um, notable examples, Harry, they called him Hooky Rothman, was one of Cohen's top guys. They they shoot him in the face. The, the Italians whack him. Net, and um, then Nettie Herbert was another bodyguard. Right, 1949, Nettie Herbert, another, and there were actually um, two other guys. I think there were, I think there were three guys they took out in that hit, and I think Cohen was, I think Cohen might have been wounded himself in that he he obviously survived, but they would they would ambush his entourage, right? Like they would find out where he was going, and then he would have a bunch of guys around him, um, you know, Secret Service style, and a lot of those guys ended up being clipped. Yeah, and then one of the most outlandish attempts on his life by the Italians is in um or uh, on against the Cohen organization is in 1950 the December murder of Cohen's lawyer Samuel Rummel. So first of all it's interesting that they they kill a lawyer who traditionally is considered a civilian but we know there are instances where that relationship also can become murky where if the law lo- is the lawyer really a civilian or the, or are they part of the organization right. that can get, that can get murky. But what's interesting is, um, the, um, my understanding is that the hitters were Angelo Polizzi and Carlo Licata. And this is where they made their bones. They were and princes. I, and, yeah, and I think this is interesting because I checked with, shout out to the mob, ar- mob archaeologist. You can look up their channel on YouTube. They were uh, talking with them that Angelo Polizzi, that, that this guy is not related to the oh. Polizzi's in Detroit. From okay. different he- towns, different families. Um, what about the but, Cleveland the Cleveland Polizzi's? Right, right. Which which are not related to the Detroit guys apparently for their different hometowns in Sicily. Nevertheless, Polizzi, what whichever family you're talking about, right? That, that that's a well known name. But Carlo Licata, I I want to single that one out just because here in Detroit that's a, that's a significant name. So you want to give us a little background on? Right, and we're recording this on the day that the forty the forty ninth anniversary of Jimmy Hoffa's kidnapping and killing. Um, and gave through my research that Carlo Licata, who was the uh, mafia prince of Los Angeles, uh, his dad, Nick Licata, was the underboss and then the godfather of the L.A. mafia. He, uh, N- Nick Licata, had been in Detroit during the 1920s, uh, had a dispute with Joe Zarelli. Who was the uh, Jules Rilly and Black Bill Toko, the founding fathers of the Detroit Mafia, first cousins, brother in laws, best friends. And uh, the Lakata was basically chased um, out of Detroit with a contract on his head, relocated to Los Angeles, and Dragna saved his life. Uh, saw that he could, you know, make money from him. And, uh, reached out to, to Topo and Zerilli and, and got the contract lifted. And as Nick Licata was rising through the ranks of the L.A. Mafia, uh, so fast forward 20, so, 20 or so years later, he's the underboss and he's in line to become boss. They needed to really bury the hatchet with Detroit. And 
a common method of doing that was marrying off a son to a daughter of two feuding factions. And uh, Lakata was married off to the daughter of Black Bill Toko in a 1952 ceremony, I believe, and moved to Detroit after he had made his bones in Los Angeles. He was a suspect in a couple different murders, not just the the uh, the murder of Mickey Cohen's attorney. He was also a suspect in the two Tonys murder. Um, so he he was a the son-in-law of a, of a godfather. He was then the brother-in-law of Black Bill's son, Black Jack, who Black Jack Toko became the boss of the Detroit Mafia from the 70s into 2010s and when he died about 10 years ago. And uh, there's a lot of people that believe, and I believe, that Jimmy Hoffa was killed at Carlo Licata's house, which is about three or four minute drive from where he was kidnapped at the uh, Red Fox on uh, in Bloomfield Township at 15 mile in Telegraph. You go up to 17 mile, which is about a two mile trip north it's called Long Lake Road. And uh, you go about up less than a quarter mile east. Lakata uh, had a residence there that was known as the House on the Hill. And it was a place that was known to be a sit down location for guys that were on the east side that were coming to the west side of Detroit for business. Uh, most of the Italians at that point lived on the east side. Tony Giacalone had his headquarters starting in the late 60s, early 70s. He had his headquarters at the South Athletic Club, which was on the west side. So he needed a place where he could have meetings in, discreet, in a discreet location. Uh, that's at 17, uh, Lakata's house was at 17 mile. The, um, South Athletic Club was at 11 miles. So it's about a six mile difference. Probably take about 10, 15 minutes, less than probably less than 15 minutes. And he, and he was known to meet Hoffa there uh, at least a half a dozen times. He had met Hoffa at, La, at the Lakata house, Tony Jack Deloney had, um, for uh, meetings. So Hoffa disappeared on his way to meet Tony Jack Deloney. I believe he was taken to Lakata's house, killed there, and then um, disposed of at a sanitation company. But the the final tie-in to Lakata was on the six-year anniversary, so uh, 43 years ago today, July 30th, 1981, which was six years from when Hoffa was killed. Lakata popped up dead at that residence. Suspicious circumstances. Two bullet wounds to the chest. Gun found about 10 feet away from him with no uh, fingerprints. And the FBI and it, it, it happened it's at suspicious. The, well, the I FBI mean, thinks we, the FBI thinks it's a su uh, think it's a murder, not a suicide. Right, we've, we've had FBI agents on our show where we've directly asked them. <clears throat> about that and they they yeah they don't they don't buy it because and, I think that uh, was the official local police department d determined it a suicide right yeah i've seen the police file it's like two pages long it's like yeah, the, the, the thinnest police file you've ever seen in your life or something like that uh and um it happened at like almost the exact same time not just the same day but at like the same time it was like three o'clock which was like Pretty much the same time Hoffa was killed. Um, so I, there's a lot of message murders in the history of the Detroit Mafia. Things that are meant to be only understood by people that need to understand it. It's not meant for the public to understand. So. Um, and some other I, interesting insight into Lakata, specifically with Los Angeles, tying it back to this is. If you ever look at Jimmy Fratiano's book, The Last <laughs> Mafioso, he doesn't think very highly of Carlo Licata. It definitely seems Carlo Licata was a, a capable guy, right? He's involved in these murders, but but Jimmy Fratiano, who, who became a snitch, of course, he doesn't think very highly of Licata, and you get some real good insight into that. He was a, he basically Fratiano calls him a, pussy. Was a member of the Los Angeles Brigada. He basically calls him a pussy. 
Yeah. Yeah. He, he even said, at right. the wedding, at the wedding with Toko, he basically says he told him to go fuck himself or, I mean, yeah. more or less. <laughs> I mean, one of the hits, it might have been the um, Rummel hit. I don't know if Fratiano was on that or another hit that Fratiano was on with Wakata. Wakata turned to him and said, well, what would Papa do? Meaning like Nick Wakata and Fratiano was like, what, what, why are you talking about that right now? We're in the middle of a fucking hit. Like, it doesn't matter what Papa would do. It matters what I'm telling you to do right now. Right. Yeah. He didn't think very highly of Lakata. Um, but I mean, it, it is interesting. It's, it's a, it's a fun kind of diversion because Carlo Lakata is, you know, an important Detroit figure, but he, he was involved in this murder of, of one of Cohen's associates. And um, by the way, shameless self-promotion we just dropped an episode about the Hoffa disappearance and murder where Scott sat down with FBI agent Greg Stasekel. And um, it's an outstanding episode where the, if you if you want more than just what the few minutes we were talking about it, I highly recommend that that episode. Um, I also overlooked, though, back to Cohen that in um, about a year before the Romo murder, the the Italians tried to kill Cohen again with a bomb. They blew mm-hmm. up his fucking house in, I think it was February of uh, 1950. And the only reason why Cohen survived, I think a, a floor safe deflected the blast. And so he was, um, he survived. But again, this is another example where he let the media in, take pictures, like, you know, and he gave his standard, like, I don't know why anyone would try to kill me. You know, I'm just a, <laughs> just a fun guy. I don't, I don't know what's going on. So, um, they're they're battling back and forth for control of Los Angeles, Cohen and the Italians. But in 1951, um, Cohen is convicted of of tax evasion, so they weren't able to get him on murder or assault or robbery, bookmaking. It's sort of a analogous to the Capone thing, right? They get him on. It might have saved his tax life. Evasion. Yeah, maybe that's a good that's a that's a good point. Um, he um. He he famously said with tax evasion, he said, the problem was I started paying taxes in the first place because <laughs> he's he started paying taxes Let a paper and, trail, and yeah. then he stopped again. And then so he said, once you start, they're going to keep on expecting that. So in, in 51, he's convicted of tax evasion. He goes to uh, a prison. He, he struggles with with confinement because he's he has OCD. And, not, and I'm not just being that like like no. flipping about that like he was diagnosed with it like he, he i can relate i am i have some ocd so i can yeah relate. yeah so it, it it's like a real thing and um but in in 55 he is he is uh released he's he's back in los angeles and as you point out he also had a reputation as a womanizer and he is dating younger and younger women around this time uh that seems to be his 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 appetite and one of his scams at this point is selling the life rights <laughs> to his uh, or the the rights to his life story and it's it's a scam basically like he's selling it to multiple multiple people with no intention yeah. of of ever of ever honoring that yeah. we've heard that there have been some other people that uh <laughs> we mentioned on the show in the last hour uh that um has have been alleged to have maybe done some of the similar things. So another, uh, you know, through line there. Right. Right. I've, I've heard that too. Um, another interesting part of the Mickey Cohen story is, you know, he's, he, he, he overlaps with these interesting people, Lakata, Dragna, Bugsy Siegel. In 1958, we need to talk about his, his relationship with Johnny Stompanato. Johnny Stompanato is an Italian hoodlum in Los Angeles. And um, I'm not quite sure why I'm not an expert on Cohen, but for whatever reason, Stompanato was in Cohen's camp. He wasn't wasn't with Dragna, wasn't with Dragna and he is Cohen's bodyguard enforcer. And Stompanato was also a a major figure in Los Angeles, not only in terms of the underworld, but like a man about town. People know who he is. He dated actresses. He dated, he dated well-known, right including Lana Turner. So, uh who was, you know, arguably one of the biggest movie starlets at 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 that time. And um as far as we know, and I, I think the evidence is pretty compelling that 
they had a tumultuous relationship and that he was abusive toward her and and possibly abusive toward her daughter. And at one point, this is uh, April 4th, 1958, they're having a rip-roaring fight, Stompanato and Lana Turner, and Lana Turner's daughter, at least that's the official story, her daughter grabs a knife and stabs Johnny Stompanato to death. And uh, there was a trial. Mickey Cohen was was called to testify, but he wouldn't he wouldn't say anything. But this was a massive spectacle, tabloid Hollywood spectacle. One of the most well known actresses of that era dating a mobster, and the mobster gets stabbed to death in her home. Um, just a huge story. It's really shocking. Time. It's really shocking, like that it's never made it that that story has not been told in in movie form um we were talking off off uh, screen that i know that keanu reeves for a time period had the, had a project where he was going to play johnny stampanato and was trying to develop it for a while and it never happened but uh it's really it's one of those stories that you think after you know 60 70 years later that um you, you would have seen some adaptation of that yeah, and Lana Turner was in some of those great, like, film noir, you know, black and white, old-timey crime films from that era. So, um, but the, it's ruled self-defense. Um, I think there are, I don't know enough about it, but I know that there are some conspiracy theories that that think Lana Turner is actually the one who stabbed him to death. And that the lawyers convinced the, the daughter to take the rap because she was underage and would be less likely prosecuted. But I, I, don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but anyhow, that was another blow to, to Mickey Cohen's organization. So he really, he really doesn't have much left at, at, at that point. I, I think would, would you be comfortable saying that by the, the late fifties, early sixties, the Dragna family has won that. Yeah. They've won the streets. I, 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 yeah. Mean, I would think so. Right. Um, so 61, um, Cohen goes on trial for tax evasion again. He is convicted. He serves 81 days. He gets a temporary release on appeal, which, of course, in his style, typical of him, he makes a big spectacle of it. He goes to the, this fancy place for a shave and, you know, he's going shopping and makes a big deal out of it. But uh, after his appeal, he is sent to Alcatraz where he has to um, uh, serve his, um, I think it was seven months later, he, 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 he returned. He has to go back to prison and he is in um serves time in alcatraz and while he's there he is i think it was uh, may 1962 he, he's he's on alcatraz and he's considered a problematic prisoner once again because of, uh, largely to do with his ocd um you can imagine like if you're really uptight about hygiene and cleanliness like that was his thing that was his specific form of ocd how like being imprisoned in especially a place like Alcatraz would, you know, I mean, it was driving him crazy, like literally. And in addition, his family, particularly his brother, would send these letters constantly to the prison, harassing the officials. So I, I just point that out because some of these prisoners, infamous prisoners we hear about at Alcatraz, some of the officials would say, well, they were actually like a model prisoner, right? regardless of how notorious they were on the streets, like creepy Carpus, Alvin Carpus from the Ma Barker gang was, was considered like pretty model prisoner. Yeah. yeah mo right. But not he taught like, Charles Manson how to play uh, guitar. <laughs> yeah, so, so like, but Mickey Cohen was considered like a pain in the ass. Um, eventually he's, he's transferred to Atlanta in uh, 63. And when he is, while he's there, he gets into an argument with this convicted thief named Burl McDonald. And McDonald actually beats Cohen with a lead pipe and fractures his skull. I mean, like beats the shit out of him. And Mickey Cohen was never the same. After Maybe this that. explains some of the behavior that when he gets out in 72 and but there's four years between when he gets out of prison and when he dies. As I said at the beginning of the show, he starts going on the talk show circuit. Yeah. And starts like becoming like a like a parlor almost like a parlor trick uh for um comedians and 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 talk show hosts that were 
hosting variety shows and talk formats uh, on the networks in the in the early 70s. Yeah, I think they got a kick out of the fact that he was in his heyday. He was a real gangster. And he, we, we know he was with Bugsy Siegel, Johnny Stampinato. He, I think he claimed to have known Capone. So you can imagine why, you know, people like the talk show circuit thought he was an interesting guy. He ate it up. Guy. He, he right. ate it up. And he loved it. Right. He loved that. Um, but I, my understanding is neurologically. Dude, no, right. He was, never, he was never the same after the, and he had like a metal plate in his head, skull. It wasn't like the guys in the mafia when he came home looked on, looked on to, or looked at him as some elder statesman that they could, you know, go to for counsel or as a sounding board. He was that, that whole part of his life was, you know, 10, 15 years before that. And he was fully on his own, just trying to stay relevant and to stay relevant. He became kind of a novelty. Yeah, and, and so if you look at it, he gets out in 72, the underworld landscape has changed quite a bit. So um, most of the people that he knew and that would have respected him were either dead or in prison. So and and so he comes out to a world where he really doesn't have any juice, like in terms of like being a street guy. So at this point, he basically is somewhat of just a celebrity mm -hmm. at, at this point, not really right. a celebrity gangster, just a celebrity. Right. At, at at this point. And his um um uh, his last publicity stunt was in 74 when during the Patty Hearst kidnapping, if you know the history right, Patty Hearst was originally kidnapped and then she actually becomes became part an of acolyte the, of the, <laughs> of the, the kidnap. Year. She joined the kidnappers in their right. uh domestic terrorism going to rob banks and right. blow up the, government the Symbi, buildings. I uh, was at the Symbies uh Liberation Symbies Liberation Army. Army. Yeah. yeah. So she actually then, right, she converts. Originally, it's a ransom, and then she converts, and um, he offers, he goes to the media and says he can, he can, he can you know, solve it. He can he fix can, it. Right, right. He can fix it. And so that's the, one of his last major publicity stunts. And then by 76, he has stomach cancer, and he dies, and he was uh, in his early 60s. So by today's standards, a fairly young person uh, to die. But I think he's one of the more colorful gangsters, certainly of Los Angeles, but even even just in the United States. So what would you think to wrap up? I mean, what do you think is his legacy, Mickey Cohen? I think this this is this is my takeaway that. When people first think of Jews in organized crime, they immediately think of they're the money guys, they're the the brains. They're the ones that are, you know, puppeteering. Like Roth, but in, Arnold Rothstein kind right. of guy. But in reality, almost every city um, had fearless, vicious, ruthless Jewish gangsters that had a lot of bodies um, and were just as tough and just as formidable as any of their Italian counterparts. Um, and sometimes I think that gets a little bit lost in some of the, I don't know, stereotypes or, or um, it's just, you know, gets lost in the wrinkles of history. So I yeah, just that, think he, rep yeah. he represents that. Yeah, it's a good point. We think of even Lansky, who, by the way, was in his, in his own right, especially when he was younger, was, was a, was a tough guy. He killed gangster. people. <laughs> right. Right. But they think they saw he was the brains behind the the, the, yeah. the Genovese family, uh, Arnold Rothstein. But right when you look at a deeper history, the Purple Gang in Detroit, guys like Mickey Cohen, uh, the guys in Murder Inc., um, Bugsy Siegel. I mean, they, yeah, these were not like the the mob accountants. Right? These were these were street guys who were killing people, running rackets, bosses. Ko so, Conan's Ko Conansberg. That guy was kid. That guy was beating up people in his in his uh, retirement home. Yeah, yeah. Harry Konensberg. They call him K. They called him Ko. He was a yeah. Genovese uh, a Jewish racketeer in the Genovese, um, yeah. and he had lots of bodies. And uh, ten years ago, he was in a in a nursing home, and he was uh, it was like Uncle Junior from The Sopranos. He was shaking people down. Yeah, and even if you go back farther to more of like the Mickey Cohen area. 
uh, era, sorry. Um, Buck Halter. Oh, yeah. Lepke, Lepke Buck Halter. Buck, and he was yeah. a psychopath. So, yeah, I think so. I, I think if there's a takeaway, one, to, I, I like Scott's analysis there that that a lot of these Jewish gangsters were serious street guys, not just the, the brains behind the operation or the money guys. But also, I think just to reiterate the, the point you mentioned at the beginning is he he's in this line of celebrity gangsters from Capone to maybe Luciano. You could put in there Bugsy Siegel, Sam um, Giancana. Then you have Mickey Cohen. You have Giancana. Gotti. Have Gotti. Joey Merlino. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's there's about a, a 10 to 12, you know, uh, guys in that in that kind of, you know, category. Just as we wrap up, I think it's. It's also interesting to note that w- w- what you're seeing from Merlino now or from Gotti in the 80s or even Mickey Cohn and Capone before that, in different criminal spaces, such as the cartels, th- th- these guys are all the cartel. A lot of the cartel guys are all over social media. And and being celebrity mm-hmm. gangsters mm-hmm. on Instagram. So it it's I th- what I think I'm saying is like I think some of that stuff that you saw from Capone and Mickey Cohn and Sam Giancana and Gotti actually had a maybe a bigger influence on guys outside of LCN than or and obviously Pablo and El Chapo and uh, the way they lived, but it, it's the way that someone like Mickey Cohn lusted for the spotlight, and I think that was a foreshadowing to what we have. That was a, that was an anomaly back then. Now it's almost, it's way more normal. Yeah. We, another shameless self-promotion, the episode we did with uh, Deborah Bonello, who wrote the book Narcas. We talked about that in our conversation, the, the narco cultura in, in, in Mexico, where it's not like you're supposed to be low key and not draw attention to yourself where it's 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 become a very kind of fashionable thing to be a, a cartel gangster and be on social media, even to the point of the, where you're ostentatious after death, like to have who has the most um, conspicuous mausoleum, yeah, I want a go- and gold plated like gun with right. Cartier right. diamonds and the on the trigger finger. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it, when you look at American organized crime, you know, that was usually frowned upon with the exception of some of these notable Giancana and I would say Mickey Cohen was in one of mm-hmm. those one of those exceptions. But um globally, especially today, yeah, Mickey Cohen, that would be this that would be the standard. That guy. I, I wonder again, this is an aside. I I wonder in terms of New York guys, what would Vinny Bastiano be like right now? Or what would he have been like if he would have stayed on the streets another 10 years, 15 years with social media? Uh, I could see I could see Vinny. Vinny Gorgeous doing the same thing that Joey's doing right now. Yeah, he's, maybe he I'm seems, wrong. He seems to be a guy that that um, not the. Would, I shouldn't say the same thing. I think he's got a little bit more respect for 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 the uh, for the oath. But uh, I could see him being on social media, maybe not doing a podcast and yeah. having a YouTube channel. Yeah, he didn't seem to be a guy that that shunned the spotlight. I would say right. at, the, at the at the very least. So. Um, but anyhow, we hope that, that that everyone enjoys this. We we look forward to doing more of these kinds of episodes. Uh, back to back Hollywood examples. Last episode was uh, Eddie Nash. Eddie Nash, <laughs> Life yeah, hitting LA hard. Yeah, so um, we're gonna keep on doing this. We have some other ideas. We see people, you know, making suggestions, and we appreciate that. Hopefully, bring you some more Life and Crimes episodes soon. Again, uh, thank you for watching, listening. Please like, uh, share, subscribe. subscribe. And um, if you like the the uh, video content, you know, we have some audio episodes that aren't on video. We have a lot of video content that's not on audio. So just, you know, encourage people to be multimedia. If you want your OG fix, check out the video and the audio channel. And uh, anyhow, thanks again. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. And we're out. Oh.